and with the presentations, Grant Holland will be facilitating the questions and things like that. So that's Grant. This is Natalie over here, who I'll introduce when we get to her presenting. So just wrong way. Setting the scene. I don't know if any of you know about this, but New Zealand is actually, you will never know about it from our news media, New Zealand's actually doing really well at the moment in world terms. This is, it was just in The Economist a few weeks ago. They came out with who's, who's the best country sort of thing. There's been a bit of that floating around over Christmas. And the company we're keeping is Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, the Nordic countries, Switzerland, New Zealand and Singapore. And you go, hang on, how is New Zealand number six in the world in these sorts of rankings? That's not us. We're, we're number 50 or 100 or, or slightly better than Central African Republic at the best sort of thing. But um, no, we're not. Um, and, and we're doing... The thing we keep thinking about is we, we're not so good on the economy, and that's the stuff we focus on, but in terms of ease of doing business, innovation, less corrupt, good human development, um, and overall prosperity, we do pretty well by international comparison. So that's, that's The Economist. Um, oh, wrong way. Le Gartman, which is a, a think tank, um, they, they put out an annual one of these, and they've got us at number five as well. And the thing that I find interesting about these slightly different measures, um, the problem we also have is we always, always compare ourselves with these guys, Australia, and they're normally one place or two places ahead of us in all these sorts of rankings. Like, oh, you know, we're behind Australia again, sort of thing. But, yeah, there's 200 odd countries in the world, and we're sitting in the top, we consistently sit in the top 10 of these surveys. And again, economy's not in the top, we're in the top 30, but not in the top 10. But overall, we're in the top 10, and at this stage, we're at top 5. Wanted to emphasise governance, personal freedom, Social capital and governance and social capital are areas where local government, the sector we work in, impacts. Because good governance, you know, helps helps everybody get on with life. Education, we're number one. You'd never know that listening to our to our media and things like that. You'd think we've got the rubbishiest education system in the world here. Australia's number two. Um, by how they measure these things, there's heaps of. If you ever go looking for this, there's about 55 million pages of appendices as to how they measure it. Um, but. The social capital is all about local involvement and stuff like that, and volunteer work and, and things like that. We do really well with that stuff. Um, so they have all these sub indices. I just thought we'd run very quickly through those. We're in the top 30, but not the, ten, the top 10 on economy. We're in the top 30, but not the top 10 on entrepreneurship. Red's bad. Funnily, one, one particular continent that um, <laughs> which doesn't do so well. Um, we are number two in the world on governance. We're number one in education. Um, health, we're in the top 30, but not the top 10. Same with safety and security. Um, number two on personal freedom, number four on social capital. And you go, well, hey, this is a pretty good place. It's just, we like to gripe. We don't like to look at the, we're, we're a very glass half empty sort of a country, really. Um, and this is the company we keep. So this is just the summaries of the top 10. So Switzerland, Denmark, Luxembourg, Iceland, Canada, Norway, New Zealand, these are in the top 10. Now, if you want a challenge in your life professionally, Zimbabwe, Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, Chad, Congo, those are places where you could, if you live long enough, you could make a huge difference. Um, and, you know, people that follow Zimbabwe, I know we've got a few um, people here who come from South Africa, that is all about absolutely lousy governments and corruption. And, you know, that's, that's where you end up after two or three decades of that. It's so bad you got it down twice. Well, no, they, they lose on economy and they lose on government. So, you know, they're, they're the worst in the world on those two things. Now, no surprises there. Democratic Republic of Congo is about a civil war. Everybody else wants their resources and is prepared to shoot them for them. Um, and, and on it goes. So, we're keeping a slightly different company from that, um, which is good. Some other things that the Garten had, they had a graph here, effective re regulation by social capital. We're up here with Denmark. Now, you probably don't think of New Zealand in those terms. We probably think, oh, you know, our regulation's rubbish. And our social capital, you know, we all, because the thing is, we know about our own problems. And you don't tend to know about other people's problems. But, yeah, you know, we're doing exceptionally well on that sort of graph there, right at the top of the tree. Um, this one here was, um, Tolerance of immigrants versus social capital. We're up in this block here, right at the top of that. So we've, we've got, um, we're quite an accepting society of, uh, to people that move here um, by, in world terms and with the high social capital. Um, this is where we're the, actually the outline, okay? And we're, and we're actually specifically highlighting the thing. And that this is 
GDP per capita per person. Here's Norway at 86,000, that's all about oil. Here's Kuwait, it's really rich, but not so, not so flash on the, um, on the prosperity and that the overall lifestyle. Here we are, one of the best prosperity overall index in terms of lifestyle, but our economy isn't, isn't quite up there with the absolute leaders. And that's, that's quite simple, that is New Zealand. We're not the richest country in, in the OECD, but we're one of the nicest ones to live in, in, in the overall mix. Final one here, and this is quite interesting, and this will lead into a little lead into what Natalie's showing us. Again, out of the uh, UN population and the Economist, working age population. Now, this is actually quite important because skill shortages are biting. Uh, we we continually have people drifting over to Australia and things like that. But your old Europe, Austria, Italy, Poland, Japan, Russia, Germany down here. Um, even Finland, that, that their working age population is shrinking. That's all about demographics, which we'll, which we'll hear about a whole lot more. We're in the, the fast growing, I was reading some stuff, you don't call them developing countries anymore, middle tier countries, I think, it's the word of the year. But they've all got quite young populations, growing working age population. We're still in that trend for a while. And again, I'll let Macklin tell you all about that a little bit further on. So the, the thing that drops. Um, from here as well, this is the absolute latest New Zealand Treasury fiscal projections. So they're busy updating this officially in July. This is not embargoed or anything, but this is as, as of about two or three weeks ago, this information. And we've got some challenges coming ahead, which we know about. Um, those challenges are around the fact that our health superannuation costs are going up. Um, our debt financing costs are going up because we're borrowing, as we often do, more than um, we collect and revenue in terms of government. Um, so here we've got deficit here, we're, we're supposedly sort of somewhere around about 2020 and, and um, having a budget surplus for a wee while and then by 2030 we're back into deficit. Um, and just keeping all that in balance is going to be, um, there's a whole heap of assumptions that Treasury are testing with a panel of experts, I think you're on that panel aren't you Natalie, at, through you, Victoria University at the moment, but that's an interesting challenge. The thing is we know about it, the assumptions around revenue or taxes staying the same and, and effectively services provided by government staying the same, but there's a bit of a squeeze on and the local government we certainly know about that. You know, central government is squeezing local government at the moment to get its costs down and things like that. The thing that's really interesting is we're here at about 25% of GDP per populate, uh, GDP net debt. And you think, oh man, 25%, that's terrible. In, the, in 1993, at the end of the last recession, we were at 60% of debt per GDP. And, and it took us right through to about 2007 to get rid of that. It's a whole decade of that. But USA is at 100%. Um, Spain's over 100%. Italy's 120. UK's at about 80%. Greece, of course, is who knows what percentage they are because nobody knows what their GDP is. But um, a, a theoretically, 160 to 180%. So, in terms of this figure here, we're actually in a really good place. We've been able to maintain our, our support services and things like that. At the same time, we haven't run up too much debt in world terms. This is still isn't too bad in world terms. This is starting to get a bit scary and out here. Nobody is actually going to lend us that much money. It's certainly not going to lend us that much money. So um, the thing is with that is that we're going to have to make some policy with our politicians, the, the conversation in our country. Um, but we've got a little bit of time. Now, that also gets impacted by demographics as we go forward, so we'll, um, we'll hear, hear a bit more about that. Population in terms of the whole country population, this was out of National Infrastructure Plan that we dropped into the Road Maintenance Task Force report earlier or late last year. Um, and so 2006 population, 4.2 million, we know that for sure, that was off the census. 2030 projections will know a little bit better actually where they're sitting when we get this next census lot of data out by the end of the year. But um, the thing that's really interesting is where the growth is, which is Auckland Bay of Plenty and pre Christchurch, pre the earthquake, Canterbury was, was there, and it's the really fascinating thing to me what has actually happened in Canterbury. Um, and what that translated to in terms of this map here at a whole of country level was you had fundamentally a million population in the South Island. You have a million below Taupo, but including Gisborne. Northland and Waikato Bay of Plenty, 0.8, Auckland, 1.4. South Island, roughly a quarter of the country's population. 
the 2031 pop projections were saying 5.2 million, effective 5.1 million. Not a lot of growth in the South Island. Um, same with the Lower North. Waikato Bay of Plenty comes up, North of Red doesn't do anything. Auckland goes to effectively 2 million. Now, the interesting thing from us looking after infrastructure and receiving government support and help in the South Island is we go from a quarter of the country's population in, and political influence in 2006 to a fifth in 2031. Okay, so as much as we like to scream and shout that they're not getting enough and all that sort of thing, any politicians, there's one thing they do know is where their votes come from. And so what's going to happen, and, and again, I'm sure we're going to hear plenty about that, is that Auckland is going to fundamentally dominate politically as well as infrastructure spend in terms of capital and stuff like that. Now, underneath these figures, and this is why we invited Natalie down today to talk to us, there's some really interesting stuff going on. So even though that million goes to 1.15 million there, the makeup of the population demographically is changing quite quickly, and it has all sorts of knock-on implications for infrastructure, which we're going to discuss today. Um, just in terms of maybe big infrastructure, and this was um, some data we put in the Road Maintenance Task Force at the back of it, though we didn't put this, this um, diagram in, was, hey, one of the things we had to work out, well, where's maintenance expenditure going? Well, the first thing you have to do is, well, what's likely capital expenditure? So the black is the current ROMs. Uh, Waikato Expressway is marvellous, by the way. I drove on it the other day. Um, it's, it's very nice. Um, and you, so you've got the, the one north past Pooh, where you've got stuff going on Auckland, you've got this stuff going on around Christchurch, we haven't started the Wellington one yet. And so I had to look forward 30, 40 years to what's likely. Um, are we likely, and, and the reality is we could keep spending just under a billion dollars a year for the next 30 or 40 years, and we would get to where those red lines are. So what I, what I said was I was very likely that the link from Cambridge through to Tarama isn't that far, and it makes a whole lot of sense given the port. Um, I think ultimately you're going to come, you might go to Rotorua but you're, or down to Taupo, I think that's, that's a bit longer term. Um, once you're at Otaki with the, with the Wellington transmission going one, it makes an awful lot of sense just to do the last 50 k's up to Palmy. Given that Palmerston North Axis is here, North Island, Lower North Island centralised distribution hub, so there's an awful lot of warehousing and hubbing goes through um, Palmy. Um, unfortunately for the South Island, Pretty much once you've finished doing stuff in Christchurch, or a bit more around Christchurch, I think that's going to be it in terms of major capital projects. There's just nothing that pushes you to do anymore. And um, so make the most of the new Christchurch motorway is actually uh, around the back, it's actually quite nice to drive on too. But, so we should enjoy that while it's new. Um, but this is the sort of implications of, of these population and demographic shifts and things like that. Also the implications of just what's going to be driving high level road transport expenditure. So we're going to be in not building much new big stuff here and maintaining a lot of the stuff that we've got uh, going forward. That's, that's just roads. So, um, and that's it from me. So really where we want to go from there is um, to Natalie. Um, very, very welcome to have you here Natalie. Hope you um, are looking forward to enjoying the day. So Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Ah oh, well, ladies and gentlemen, it's um, really my pleasure to come down here last year when I was about eight and I was hoping to get in last night in order to have a look around the town but unfortunately a plane had to land at um, Blenheim. They said they had a little problem and I'm thinking, you know, sitting there demographer, what's the baseline? How, how, how big is this little problem? <laughs> but anyway, it was a little problem in the end. Um, okay, well, look, uh, to start with, um, of course, you know everything about what you do and I know nothing about it, right? I, mine's the demography and I always say at the start of my presentations, I can tell you about the demography, you have to listen with what your particular portfolio is and translate it. And really, it's a very important message because we're moving into, well, we're always moving into a future that we haven't dealt with before, but where we're moving at the moment, like long term, as I'll, as I'll be talking uh, about, the global end of population growth by the end of the century takes us into a whole new world and the conversations that we have to have haven't even been started. We don't know what questions to ask because we don't, we've never had societies with more elderly than children in them before. We've never faced the permanent end of growth. We've been growing, you know, for 
well, ever since New Zealand began, but going back, you know, since about 1750 when uh, growth really started, got going. So, you know, we've had a few centuries of, of, a, of, a diff of, a, of a amazing world of growth that we, you know, we, many of us here, have seen the um, world population double, like between uh, 1980, uh, 1950 and 1985, you know, the world population doubled, and here I am saying it's going to end this at the end of, around the end of the century in terms of global growth. So it's such a huge new situation that we've got to engage with, um, and the best way I can see forward is for people like you to sit <coughs> down with the demography and say, what does this mean for us? And I went through that process uh, about seven or eight years ago with the New South Wales Local Government and Shires Association, because I spent 16 years in Australia. And it was literally taking they had 158 local government areas in that uh, region at the time. They sent the, re um, the reports out that we wrote to all of them and said, what does it mean for you in terms of footpaths and libraries and, you know, uh, water reticulation, boat moorings, you know, you name it, whatever it is that you're, you're responsible for. So I don't have any answers, I just have the big picture that I'm going to share with you. Um, right, so oh, I've got to get this thing working. Hang on first. Move forward, move. Scroll down. Scroll down. Back forward. forward. That's, I'm waiting for it too. Thank you. Now we're back on that one. Actually, I'll just, while he's doing that, I was just going to say, when I'm thinking about the demography of the area this morning, and I had the most wonderful breakfast, a civilised place down here, you had some Marmite. And I was thinking, well, these people had some Marmite, and I was thinking, why are you worrying about your demography? What you should do is stop exporting Marmite and bring the people here to eat it. <laughs> the, okay, so... The big picture that I'm going to be talking about is it's this global population ageing and population ageing within each of our countries and why it means the end of growth and how, how that unfolds to be the end of growth. And it is not a figment of a demographer's imagination. Um, as I'll show you in a moment, New Zealand is relatively young on the global scale. It might explain some of our uh, good indicators there because we happen to be younger than a lot of those regions at the moment. But um, Everything that is happening across Europe in terms of their ageing, those um, negative growth for labour market and so on, labour force, we will be facing all of that too as we go forward, but we're just a little bit behind them. So the, uh, this is the overall picture. Now, I, I use this. This is one of the textbooks I use for teaching, and um, it's vastly different to what I uh, cut my teeth on, which was um, you know, the Paul Ehrlich sort of story, uh, population bomb, population explosion, and... Many of you will know that story. So the idea that the world's population was just going to keep exploding out of all proportion. And, uh, and, and we, you know, we would just see growth going on forever. Even though actually Paul Ehrlich did in one, one wee sentence in those books mention that the end of growth would actually eventually happen. But um, it was, you know, got a lot more media hype to talk about the massive explosion. So how to understand it? Yes. Um, we, we are, we're past 7 billion, uh, we'll probably get to about 9 billion around mid-century and then growth will slowly peter out so that by about the end of the century they're looking at you know, not much more than 9 billion as, as a global peak and that's a lot lower than the original UN projections of going back say um, you know, even 3 or 4 or 5 years ago. Um, oh, this is really, why is it happening? It's because of you get these populations with the age structures changing. As more people live longer, you've got the growth at the older ages, and as they have uh, young people have fewer children, you get the contraction at the base. Um, a population is sort of like a hundred-year-old pine plantation. It's all there; you can see it, and we can't just change it around in any sort of hurry. And what happens is these these populations get take on an internal momentum of decline, where you have more elderly than children, more deaths than births. So there you see Japan's projection for 2020. Um, Japan has already stopped growing, is already declining. Uh, I'll refer to this again, I, I imagine, but 
just to give you the big picture from it, um, Japan is looking at closing 440 something towns in the next five years. Now, by closing they don't mean that you can't live there, but there's no, no infrastructure, no support, no, no police, no protection, no post offices, you know. So these are some of the decisions that my colleagues are dealing with, those, those colleagues who work in Japan and across all of Europe. Um, in America, there's something like 1,400 towns on the, on the list to be looked at. We are seeing pictures of whole towns across um, in the Netherlands, for example, being um, well, houses at least and streets being bulldozed, you know, because population, once it starts to decline, you are dealing with, um, the, you know, um, abandonment of houses and abandonment of, of small towns and so on. So these are very big pictures. Now, whether New Zealand will actually reach that stage, who knows, because you're the sort of people who will make the decisions in the end. But this is really unfolding out there in the world. If you think that um, these are just projections, and I should say, and I, as I will say at the end this afternoon as well, projections can be bad for your health. You know, they are only ever as good as the assumptions on which they're based. But here, um, 2020 is like all of seven years away, so it means that the only people that are not yet born are these guys down here. And the rest of them, we know that they're there. You could keep the Japanese population growing, but they won't be Japanese. You know, this is the nature of the the problem or the issue that's unfolding. China's population um, accounts for a uh, fifth of the world's population. It will stop growing around about uh, 2025. So again, it's only just down the track. It will stop growing before New Zealand because of the one-child policy and the extreme ageing that that population is taking on. So you can see how these big, uh, big populations um, and what's happening with them are actually driving the end of growth. And I'm not saying that there's still not still massive you know, growth still going on in the developing world, but the overall growth rate, and I think I've got it here in a moment, whoops, has slowed dramatically. Peak global growth rate was uh, actually in 1962, so I was 12 at the time. Um, and the peak annual increment occurred around about 1991, 1992. So the world population is growing, but it is slowing at a rate of knots, and that will continue to go. New Zealand grows generally, our average is at the moment, or has been around the global growth rate. And, so, and Australia, this looks so amazing, when I was there I was fascinated, it was growing at one point there 2% uh, per annum, you know, it was nearly twice the global growth rate in Australia, and it's to do with the high per capita migration intake that New Zealand and Australia have. But we mustn't be complacent about the fact that our populations are growing because we are going to be competing for those migrants increasingly as we go forward. And also, those, those ageing countries where we want to get our migrants from, they're after our young people. So, you know, we, we have to uh, watch our backs there as well. Whoops. I... Okay, so this is a, a really staggering um, set of statistics. Over the next 20 years, well even not 20 years, less than that now, the more developed countries, of which we count 58, are supposed to grow by around about 3%. At 65 plus years, the growth is 25%. <coughs> All other age groups combined, 0 to 64, decline by 1%. Now these are where we're going to draw our migrants from. These are the, this is the diminishing pool in which we're competing for our young migrants. So it's not that we're not going to get any, it's just that you know, we're going to have to work harder and be a little bit more attractive and so on to, to keep them coming here. If you go out um, to 2031, 5% growth for the, all of MDCs, the 65 plus population grows by about 98 million, taking up the current 200 million to about 300 million 65 year olds in, the, in these countries. But all other age groups combined decline by 41 million. So, you know, this is, these are huge changes. This is the context in which we in New Zealand have to understand what we're doing. So, what I'm talking about here is, to me, it's time to start joining the dots. You know, we do have to understand what is going on out there. The big, whether we should be a big country or a small country, and I've got some 
um, numbers here in a minute will um, help you understand that is not being helpful. Um, population ageing, as, as one of my colleagues in Australia called it, uh, an inconvenient truth. And it had, because people are sort of slowly engaging with the idea of first, you know, there's going to be more elderly, or they get the idea that people having fewer children mean that the larger proport that the larger numbers of old population also become a larger proportion. But they don't take the next step and go, well, what happens when you have more elderly than children? Well, it's about 10 years once you have more elderly than children to having more deaths than births. And it's a situation that we haven't encountered before. But we, Waitaki is already encountering that here. Um, most important thing is that this region here is going to grow. It's going to grow quite significantly still, not nearly as much as Auckland, but it's nearly all um, at the older ages. Ageing driven growth is completely different to youth driven growth and it has huge implications for what you do. So I'm just going to look at a, briefly at national trends and sub-national trends and um, then this afternoon I've got some more detailed uh, data for the local, the local TAs here so I'll just sort of touch on it this morning. I'm happy to take questions as we go along. Um, and again, just caution the fact that especially when we're dealing in this area, the projections and so on that we're using, of course we, we need the much delayed uh, census to know what the true picture is. Um, it's, you know, the, we can't even say really what the margin of error is, except that remember that what goes into projections are birth registrations and death registrations, which we know are very accurate. Um, we have international migration, which gives us a reasonable idea of what's going on, but it's those internal migration trends that we just uh, don't really know. So all fill in your censuses next week and do it online because that will make Stats New Zealand very happy and they can go to the international conferences and tell them that they have the best online um, take up in the world. Okay, so I want to start with this um, New Zealand uh, Institute of Economic Research's suggestion that New Zealand should have a population of um, 15 million by 2061, because this is the argument that people keep coming back to me with. Okay, so if we were to assume that the birth rate, 2.1 births per woman, is what you need to replace the population, if that remained constant, we push life expectancy at birth up to 95 years, and that's Stats New Zealand's highest assumption, and we give it for both males and females. We increase annual net migration um, to 100,000 a year, Normally it's around about, well, the medium variant is about 12,000 a year. Um, if we keep the age structure of migrants very youthful, notwithstanding what I just said about the fact that we'll be competing on a diminishing pool and migration positive at all ages, mm -hmm. so that instead of what we usually do is we lose young people and we gain people at ever so slightly older, uh, like middle ages, um, we keep it positive at all ages, our 2061 population would be 10.8 million and 22% would be over the age of 65. So it's really bigger population, not much difference in terms of the actual ageing. And if you happen to read the NZIER report, they point out right through it the impossibility of achieving the, um, I, the p possible target population of, of 15 million. So it's really important that you understand those things because the debate, and I keep getting calls from the media about it, it's not about whether it's achievable, it's about where should they live? You know, what will they be like? Who will they be? <laughs> you know, how are we going to manage this big population? And it's impossible. So it's much more important that we engage with <laughs> the realities that we're dealing with, and that is the fact that there will be growth, but most of that growth will be at the older ages. If, you, if we wanted to get that 15 million population by 2061, and I tried various runs on my, uh, with my software, uh, we'd want 150,000 net migrants a year. We'd have to keep the replace, the fertility rate at 2.1. <coughs> New Zealand, as I'll say again in a minute, already has the highest birth rate in the developed world, so we would really be pushing it. Um, or we need the birth rate to get back up to baby boom levels, about 3.5 <laughs> births per woman, uh, and keep it, you know, a, a, a more achievable 100,000 migrants a year. So you see the difficulty. It's really not possible, and it's not possible because of these inconvenient truths about population ageing. So, see that? Actually, highest birth rate in the developed world. Our global growth rate, as you saw, is looking pretty good. We've got lots and lots of young Kiwis that seem to be popping up everywhere. And in fact, be careful if you want to close any of your schools or have them closed on you. 
there's been a wee baby blip born since about 2002. It peaked in around 2008. And that little wave, I promise you, will actually get to intermediate school, <laughs> you know, in about five years' time. Um, they're just going through primary school now. They're very, very important. I actually called them GNT GYH. Thank God you're here because they will arrive at the door of the labour market exactly at the time that the biggest cohorts from the baby boom, born around 1960, um, reach the age at which they start to retire. So that little baby blip is so precious and we absolutely must school it perfectly and encourage it to stay here and let it know how, you know, how much we need it and value it and so on. And we shouldn't close schools on them at the same time as having to have an eye on the fact that we do have you know, diminishing numbers coming behind them. So it's like, follow the demography. And you know, I just don't know whether Hekia Parata actually does use it. You would think they do. You know, they've got entire armies of advisors at their, at their um, beck and call. But according to some people who I know very well who know what goes on in there, no, they don't. So uh, it is a bit of a worry. OK, so. I've already said, um, we, we are a very young country globally. We had, uh, we had the longest baby boom in the world, in the developed world, and the highest peak birth rate, and that is why we are one of the youngest um, developed countries today. But you can see how much we've changed since uh, 1961. So, um, there's me, and, yeah, and uh, a few of you, I can see you in there. And you can see by how much the population has aged. And these changes are just unfolding. You know, unless you put them into graphs, you can't really see them. Whoops, where are we? OK, now, the important point, I'll just roll these numbers. Oh, something's happened. I made this slide, which I believe, on my little Apple Airbook, and it does not like the other programs, so it's not going to show what it should be shown. These are the age groups, um, 0 to 14, 15 to 24, uh, 25 to 39, I think it is. Um, anyway, the top one is 65 plus, and this is the working age population. So you can see that it's not really going to grow very much. It grows a bit, as um, Ross pointed out, but as a proportion of the total population, it declines from about 66% at the moment to 60%. Blow, there was a lot of good stuff on that slide. Um, okay, then across the country, as you would be well aware, uh, ageing differs by region. And this is something that is not really talked about a lot. You might talk about it among yourselves, but the discussion about population ageing is all about national level stuff. And we have to realise that national level usually means Auckland. Auckland is very young, so Auckland is growing, Auckland gets the greatest share of the growth and so on. You see they're only 10% over the age of 65. Um, but actually that like the excess of young people in Auckland does not help a local person down here if they're looking for a particular you know, labour market um, segment and so on. So Canterbury's sort of in the middle there, 15.1% over the age of 65. Kept youngish, as you would be aware by your, what we call a university town profile, so you get these little wings out here, and that's what makes um, Hamilton also um, one of the youngest or the youngest territorial authority in the country. And there, over here, is what Canterbury's age structure is projected to look like around about 2031, compared with um, 2001 as it is at the moment. So, sorry, yeah, the unshaded bit, the unshaded bit is the projection for 2031, compared to what it looks like at the moment. And you see there, the region taking on this internal momentum of decline where you start to get more elderly than children. By 2031, Canterbury is expected to have about a quarter over the age of 65 compared to New Zealand at just, uh, total New Zealand at just 20%. Um, Canterbury then are uh, going to grow for some time yet, and this is a different picture to what a lot of the regions are dealing with that I'm talking with. So, Sun is going to continue to shine on the area here. Um, probably won't like double or anything because of the uh, sort of the issues that I'm talking about in terms of the ageing. Because um, like in the Waikato, there's rumours keep going around, and I know Ross, you've dealt with South Waikato, and the idea that 
uh, we can do something that will make the population grow double or treble again. Keep in mind those big pictures. Most of our growth or our growth will increasingly depend on migration and those migrants will be harder and harder to get. So it's just, we are looking forward at the, an end point. Um, as I'm saying, ageing driven growth isn't the same as youth driven growth. So here is that growth for the Canterbury region up to 2021, around 8% say, um, and out to 2031, 16% growth. But you see most of it at the older ages. Um, I think it's something like 83% is, occurs at the uh, 65 plus years. And you have to ask yourself, you know, what, are, what does a picture like that mean? For, for things like transport infrastructure. And I'll have a, as I said before, I don't know about these things, but I can have a wee dig at them occasionally and I'll have a little um, comment later on about the potential issues for, um, for example, housing assets and things like that. If you've got a growth in what you would call your decumulator population, um, i.e. people over the age of 65, and your accumulator population, younger population coming through to buy those houses and the one is um, declining and one is growing. Yeah, um, my mother, right? hmm? You haven't met my mother if you think people are oh, accumulating. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm still accumulating too. I, I don't mean that, but it's where the decumulation starts and the changing, changing um, housing quality and different types of housing and so on. So that's your that's the projection for here and again um, it is based on 2006 data but it's been updated, and these are the latest updates, some um, 2012, and they take into account what happened in Christchurch. And they've uh, actually, you know, the net migration assumption in these projections is um, about 13,800 for every five years. So it's quite, it, you know, it's reasonably strong net, uh, net as migration assumption, but <clears throat> it may be higher as the Christchurch build happens, or it, it's hard to know whether the base that we've been working off is accurate. So we're all waiting to see to what extent that will be really accurate, that picture. Um, <clears throat> OK, so here we go, this huge shift that's coming in the ratio of young to old. And again, as an increasingly older person, um, we have to ask ourselves, you know, is, is it a problem? Like, you know. There is going to be so many things, so many good things out of population ageing that we haven't yet engaged with because all we hear is the gloom and doom about you know, how much they're going to cost the system. But you know, think about it. In New Zealand, pensions, for example, get paid na um, you know, nationally, but they get spent locally. You know, it's not a bad thing to have a, a bigger, older population in your area. Older population, as Ross and I were saying last night, they um, you know, out there engaging, doing all sorts of incredible volunteer work, and you've got an increasingly qualified, educated, older population out there doing all sorts of incredible things. Who knows what, what they will uh, generate in the future. So it's not about um, it being a gloom and doom situation. It's just about saying that these are the changing realities and there must be issues that you have to deal with. Going back to that, where the growth is, if you thought your population was going to grow by um, you know, 10,000 and it's all at the older ages, would you build a new peak hour transport system or would you look at an elder friendly type of transport system or something, put in place something for them. But here you go um, on the medium projections, say 8% growth out to 2021, 40% growth, 41% at 65 plus years, all other age groups combined for this region grow by 2% and out to 2031, that 16% growth. 88% um, at 65 plus years, all other age groups combined, 3%. You can see why um, on your slides there, Ross, why the education, boat education is um, going down. It's not so much, I think, that they're planning to take the money away. It's just that over the next, over the next five years alone, there will be 20,000 fewer school leavers in New Zealand. And over the following five years, there's another 8,000 fewer as, this, as the babies that weren't born, you know, through the... Uh, 90s sort of come through but then as the little baby blip comes through we have to be ready for it because around 2022 I think it starts to emerge at university age and the numbers will go back up to higher than they are at the moment. Now how do you deal with that? And of course you've got to be thinking ahead as well in terms of how do you supply this stuff. 15 years time there's not going to be too many of my cohorts still teaching 
at the universities and we're seeing governments quite keen to downsize some of the teaching numbers. But this blip as it moves through is going to be needing to be trained at the other end. So I'll come back to those points soon. Um, yes, 84% of growth here expected to be at 65 plus um, compared to just 25% of the growth that occurred between 1996 and 2011. And it's those sort of shifts that I'm going to talk more about this afternoon. So what does population ageing really mean? And I've already uh, foreshadowed this. So we've got, it's really important that we break these dimensions out because when you just look at the population out there, you can't see it, but it's the different components of population ageing have different implications for whatever it is that you particularly do. So the increase in, uh, the absolute increase in the number of elderly, we call that numerical ageing. It's 100% guaranteed. We know almost exactly how many people there will be because you don't get born at that age. <laughs> you, you know what the migration rates are and you know what the age-specific death rates are. Primarily caused by increasing life expectancy and locally, of course, in some of your areas, you're getting a bit of an in-migration of retirees. Structural ageing is when the declining birth rates cause those increased numbers to become an increased proportion of your population. And locally, the net loss of young adults um, accelerates that shift. So I'll illustrate that in a minute. Then, that step that I said that is the real inconvenient truth, once you have more elderly than children, it's about 10 years to reaching the point of more deaths than births and the end of the natural growth phase that we have experienced for about, well, in the Western world, about 300 years. An absolute decline because in regions where you already have a net migration loss or you can't get sufficient migrants in there to replace those um, lost births and increased deaths, then that population will stop growing. The important message is that if this is happening in your particular area, it's not something you're doing wrong. And it is, uh, I've got a slide to talk about that in a minute. It's really important to understand that you just be ahead of the game, if you like, and just you know, closer to what's happening in, across in Europe and Japan and Canada and all of the other countries that we look to. So over a third of New Zealand's TAs are already in decline. They have reached basically the, the end of their growth phase. Um, of course, what population projections tell us is that you can, you know, population projections say that if X, Y and Z happen, births, deaths and migration do this, then this is what your population will look like. And you can intervene and change some things in a small way, but you've always got to think about that overall context. What I'm showing you here is what's happened already. And so turning these, to try and turn these pictures around is very difficult because of the age structures of some of those areas. But nevertheless, some of these um, areas are projected to come momentarily out of decline, maybe over the next 10 years, based on that migration assumption. So a couple of your ones in there, Mackenzie and Waimati, and Waitaki. I'm never quite sure how to deal with Waitaki because it's split down here and I don't know what proportion, I didn't have time to go into what proportion you get and I didn't oh, think it really right. mattered. Huh? Yeah, we've got several people from Waitaki here today. Oh well you could tell me all about it then because... We split <coughs> Yeah, I mean for the, for the purposes of the presentation it was just, it's just to say this is the big picture, don't sort of get too hung up on the detail. It, if you can t get a message at the end of the day it's that global ageing, that population ageing basically contains within it the, end, the seeds of, grow, of the end of growth and there's nothing that you can do about it and it's about knowing that bigger picture and engaging with it and it doesn't mean don't go and build beautiful buildings like this because this is the issue if you don't you're kissing your population goodbye you've got to have them in the short term it's this it's this 40 or 50 years as we transit the cusp from growth to decline that is going to be such a challenge and why it's so important that central government comes on board and understands you know, what's going on in the regions demographically and you know, comes up with a new way of dealing with it. Does it matter? Some of my very esteemed colleagues wrote a paper that got a lot of press in Europe 
and one of the little lines in it, they said that subnational decline is devoid of strategic importance unless accompanied by decline at the national level. And I'm sure that you would agree me, agree with me in saying fooey. It's absolute rubbish. Um, especially in New Zealand, if basically the growth is Auckland and the decline uh, is down here, it matters a heck of a lot, you know? And it doesn't help us because we have governments don't engage with it. It matters, I would say, to everybody that owns a house or a business, people are trying to deliver services, um, employ people, matters <laughs> to you guys with rate revenue gathering, um, demands on those rates, it matters to your regional neighbours if you're declining or you're growing, um, very much matters to your rate payers who have to, uh, and, you know, come up with more and more rates, you should hear the, well I'm sure you know what's going on in the Waikato. Um, and ultimately it does matter to everyone. So it is important to know your demography and know what's driving it and to understand that there's not a lot you can do about it um, at the same time as having to sort of carry on business as usual. So I draw on this, uh, we've got the sociologist uh, C. Wright Mills. Does any, did anybody here do any sociology in their engineering degree? No. Yes, good. Okay. <laughs> you're going to quote it for, recite it for me, recite it for me. Um, C. Wright Mills said that if one person in a population of 100,000 is unemployed, then that's his personal trouble, his or hers personal trouble, and for its resolution we look to the person. If there are 10,000 people unemployed, then that's an issue, and for its resolution we look to the structures, we look to the state. So I borrowed that several times and I've used it quite usefully <coughs> in Australia with councils. If one council is declining, that's its personal trouble. For its resolution, we might properly look to the council or to other issues, the employers or whatever decisions are being taken in the area. But if all of them or most of them start to decline, and also to decline for a new reason, and this new reason is, um, as I'll explain a bit more, bit more detail in a moment, in the past, net migration loss was the main reason for a region declining, and it's still the main reason in New Zealand. But as we get natural decline come on board as well, you've got the combination of net migration loss and natural decline, it puts you into a decline that you can't climb out of. That's the new reason, and it's not on the government's agenda. So I think it's really important that we put it there. Um, okay, so we... we I think we need to, there's a whole lot of things, we've got to have discussions about these things. Um, in Australia, they have a, a wonderful socialist thing called the Fiscal Horizontal Equalisation Act. Are any of you familiar with that? And it's a pool of about two and a half billion dollars that the local governments get, uh, can apply for. Uh, the principles of the Act are that each council should be able to deliver services um, equivalent services irrespective of their ability to do so. And if you have a higher than average proportion over the age of 65 or a, you know, you have a big day trip of population or something like that, you've got to provide services for them but they don't pay rates, you can appeal through these um, various things called disability, <coughs> disability or relativity factors. I personally think that's the sort of thing that New Zealand has to come up with because if Auckland's got all the growth and they actually um, pinching our young people and taking them up there. I'm not anti-Auckland, but it's just that the reality is that they're growing massively and the rest of the country is paying the price. There has to be some sort of shared responsibility for what's going on as we move into this new stage. So one of the main things we need to understand is that old pattern of population <coughs> decline, which I mentioned, that just net migration loss, and you still had natural increase, but the net migration loss might have been greater than the natural increase, so your population declined. The new pattern is that the net migration loss adds to the natural decline and puts you in a spin that is very difficult to get out of because of that internal momentum of decline, which is added to by the loss of young people. The young, young people go, you don't just lose them, but you lose the kids they would have had and so on. And then there's these critical, what we call midway thresholds, that's the loss at young adult ages and then or also gain at the older ages. So in Thames Coromandel, for example, which I'm most familiar with, um, you've got 
still massive growth, but it's nearly all at the older ages, and the population looks like you know it's taking on this real upside down shape. Uh, so it's growing, but it's hurtling toward the end of growth as it as it goes. So Timaru, this is what I call um, forensic demography, <laughs> if you like. We, what we do is we, we say, what was the population in 2000 at, at a particular point in time? So here's 2001, that's the grey bars. Um, we add in the births and then and we survive each age group. So we know the life expectancy of each age group and we survive it through to the next one. We can work out what our expected population would be. And then we compare it with our actual population and the difference gives us the crude measure of migration. So here you see net migration loss at these ages and net gains at that age and that age and those two tend to be connected of course because they're the parents and they tend to be the kids. So you get gains up there, you tend to get gains there and vice versa. Um, there's no other way really to get at the migration changes um, for your region other than doing this type of analysis, that's the same way Stats New Zealand do it. And um, look, you've got a bit of, bit of gain over here too at these ages, so that suggests that some maybe early retirees coming in from the rural areas or something like that coming in. You can, you can track that, you can keep an eye on it as it goes forward. Um, and for example, ha you can see that if there were that many 0 to 4 year olds at that, uh, at that time, then we expected there to be that many because you hardly lose any children to, to death. Um, this uh, 10 to 14 year olds, there were that many. We expected there to be that many, but there were only that many. That's how it, how it works. This will be useful when we get the 2013 census data. Uh, where, have all they, where have they gone? They've gone to Christchurch. Um, Christchurch gets the net migration gain there, tiny little loss there and um, gain there. I've got some of the graphs that I've got for this afternoon just shows you what it looks like for each of the other areas. But it's a really useful exercise to do. It's very easy to do it. Um, you can actually do it yourself quite, quite simply. Um, okay, so here's my graph that's not going to work. Some shift shares, but overall, as I said, an ageing Canterbury, <coughs> the big growth in the 65 plus population. You have more elderly than children here, uh, somewhere between 5 and 10 years' time, and it's already crossed over in 15% of New Zealand's TAs. Never had more elderly than children, so what does it mean for what you do? That's what you have to ask. It's not about gloom and doom or that it's bad. It's like, well, what's going to be the battle for resources over, you know, um, playground equipment or, you know, things that older people need? Those are some issues. What's really important is you notice that the 0 to 14 year old doesn't actually decline, they just, that stays steady. It's the growth of the 65 plus population that drives this crossover. And this will happen here sometime ahead of it happening in total New Zealand. So, um, <clears throat> just a few more slides really in, in this part of the presentation. So, the ageing is very definitely with us and the recent Stats New Zealand data that came out, I've analysed it, looked at that, uh, what component of the growth of each region or the change is due to the 65 plus population. You find that um, all growth in 56 of the TAs, or 84%, is at uh, 65 plus years, and in each one of those, all other age groups combined 0 to 64 decline. So that is a very big picture. Uh, 23 of those TAs are expected to also experience overall decline. So you might be growing at the older ages, declining at the younger ages. Um, then some will still grow and some will decline. But 23 of them overall decline. And some of those are the ones that were on that previous slide. Um, and there's a few new ones on there and a few of the previously declining ones, of which one or two are here, uh, come out of decline just for a short period. But the most important thing is I've done this analysis across 660-something um, TAs in Australia over 15 years, and I've worked with my colleagues across Europe, uh, and we never see any populations, once they cross a certain threshold, um, come out of the end of growth for very long. You know, you can get a bit of growth for another five or ten years, but the ageing eventually overwhelms it. 
So of the remaining 11 TAs that um, don't have all of their growth at 65 plus or and decline at 0 to 64, <laughs> two of them have around 95% oh. of their growth at 65 plus and one of them is Christchurch. Um, and again, caveats around all that. Three of them have around two thirds of their growth at 65 plus, of which uh, Waimakariri is one. Three have um, 44 to 46% of their growth at 65 plus, and one of them is Selwyn, and uh, three have only one third of their growth at 65 plus. So you can see how pervasive this, this situation is across the whole country. And again, I'll go back to my slide on numerical and structural ageing. The numerical ageing is unfolding. It's 100% guaranteed. There's nothing you can do about it short of taking us, some of us out and shooting us. Um, and we know that the decline in the, uh, in the child, child population is going to work through because they simply weren't born. And you know, when you hear employers saying, we've got labour shortages and we can't, um, you know, or nobody's, nobody's coming to us, it's like they sometimes don't realise that they didn't get born. You know, they haven't been coming for 18 years and we, we did actually know that. So how do we go forward? Most important work, uh, findings that I've got out of the work I've done is that you can see the sequential unfolding of the situation. So you can monitor it well in advance of it happening and start dealing with it. The territorial authorities with already fewer labour market entrants and exits. Now this is just based on 15 to 24 to 55 to 64. We, internationally this, these two groups are used to say these are the ones where the labour market entrants are coming from and the older ones are in the retirement window if you like. Not that any of us are ever going to be able to retire but that's the arrange, that's the um, two age groups that we use and it's important because it if you track it over time, you see it just coming down, down, down. It just keeps falling. In 1996, Can yes? Can you give us those two age brackets again, please? I missed the Sorry, number. 15 to 24 and 55 to 64. So that 55 sounds quite early to me. Is it that... sounds quite early to a New Zealander. Yeah, mm. but it's real? It's Well, the drop-off starts at 55 to 64. But look, I'm just doing a paper related to this for the... Um, Treasury to do with the uh, raising of the Fine. age of <laughs> access. Um, New Zealanders, you, you'll be pleased to know we already have the almost the highest older age participation rates in the OECD countries. You know, my main argument is that it's already working actually really well. We can't squeeze that much more out of it. I mean, certainly 65 plus population is increasing its participation but there's a limit because once you look at all the other things that go on with it as well, if we're already the highest, it's going to be hard to get it up a lot more. And the reason that we're the highest is because you can access superannuation at 65 and not lose from it. So it, the system actually is work, and if it's working, you wouldn't necessarily want to change it. However, that's different to what I have said in the past, so I've learnt a lot from doing that paper. Um, in 1996, just uh, barely 7%, that was about 5, New Zealand TAs had, had that ratio, fewer people at labour market entry than sort of retirement zone age groups, among them Hurunui and Waimati. Um, by 2001 that had jumped up to 27%, Kaikoura, Mackenzie and Waimakariri. 2006 Timaru joined and 2011 it stayed about the same because between 2006 and 2011 we had quite strong international migration gain which kept the ratios up, but still over a third had fewer people at labour market entry than exit age. Now look what's projected to happen by 2016, and again, remember the point that I was making before, it's not because of the what's really happening that much at the younger ages, but it's this massive growth of the uh, baby boomers moving into those older age groups. So two thirds of New Zealand's TAs are expected to have really tight, demographically tight labour markets um, by 2016 and we expect some adjustment on this data when we get the 2008 census but it's probably only going to be within a few percentage points either way and Ashburton will join them and then by 2021 that's fully uh, four-fifths of the country's TAs. That means a tight labour market and that means 
labor, labor shortages and it means competition for young people and it means increased labor costs. It means a number of things that many employers don't understand yet and they have to start engaging with it in terms of looking at you know what are their mission critical skills, what are their, who do they actually need to go to run their businesses going forward and start thinking about how to have them as we move into that tight situation. Just so I understand that even more, are you saying seven years ago Timaru District had more people retiring than entering the workforce? Yes. Uh, not retiring but in the retirement zone. Okay. So this is the population. 15 to 24, the absolute number of 15 to 24 year olds and the absolute number of 55 to 64 year olds who five years on are now um, 60 to 69. And if you do use different age groupings, so sometimes I do this with 20 to 29 and 60 to 69, the ratio is worse because we have a gap at 20 to 29 in New Zealand. So 20 to 24, 15 to 24, we've still got them before they've gone to Australia. So if you, if you go a slightly higher set of age groups to see the ratio, it, it's worse. It's something like about half of the TAs already have fewer. So is that based on the, um, on the permit? Yeah. Yes. That's so, so we've got a waste on the... On the, the, age, the age structure, the age yeah. Structure. You've got a, every year from now on, every successive year, for the next 19 years, you'll have a bigger cohort reach retirement age. Not, not everybody will retire, but many will, and many will downsize what they do. And every year, for the next um, 15 years, you've got a declining cohort coming in to replace them. And then in the middle, you've got that, that bite. It is a crisis, a, a, a labour market crisis unfolding, I believe, but um, it's hard to see evidence of it at the moment with global economic Prices still hanging around, and um, you know unemployment being quite high. But we do believe that um, when I say we, um, my economist friends, when that, assuming that global economic fog lifts and people start looking for labour, they won't be there. They are not there because they didn't get born. That, that that last sentence is a bit that I think hasn't occurred to a lot of people. Mm. They didn't get born. No, that's right. So that it's, it's what was happening with the birth rates over the um, 80s and 90s that we are sort of now, or you know, particularly over the 90s, that now we're dealing with. Um, whoops, just go the other way. Just, and, and again, you know, as I say, it's a stepwise thing, so that's looking at labour market entry exit ratios. You can also look at it in terms of your um, elderly to children. 1996, no TAs in the country had more elderly than children. 2001, 3%. 2006, 4.5% of which were and Timaru. <coughs> 2011, the uh, estimate based on the last census was 16.4%. And then by uh, 2016, you see it step up. 40% of the TAs, more elderly than children, and most of your TAs. So that, and that's real evidence of the... Uh, um, ageing of this region. Uh, here's a, just a couple of slides that might, um, I know it gets a bit boring, I hear myself going on and on here. Just to put some flesh on the bones a little bit in terms of local um, industries. Those changes are very much, they are partly effect of industrial and technological change that goes on. We always say, you know, well farming is so much more advanced now, you don't have young people, we don't need as many they leave. I know you've had a lot of conversion down here, so um, you've got uh, growth in certain areas of the farming industry and so on, and got young people coming in, but there's a salutary message in there in a moment. Another one is government administration. Um, looking across New Zealand's current 67 TAs, all of them but two um, lost government jobs between 1996 and 2006. 21% decline across the whole, um, across, across your region at least, uh, here, but all of the TAs across New Zealand lost them, except for Wellington, which gained 5,500 government mm. jobs. So, you know, there are some decisions that are getting made as well. When government jobs are withdrawn from an area, they take away the people, they take away their kids, they close a school, they lose a post office, you know. These are things that can be, can be um, prevented if there's the right political will to do so. And like in Canada, for example, the government parks 
main, um, main government departments in provincial regions. Like I went to Prince Edward Island one time and there's the, the head de um, department of aged care in this little island and it was there to soak up a lot of the graduates from the university to help them stay there. And Tasmania has just recently, the Australian Bureau of Statistics have put the head um, office for the collection of agricultural statistics down in Tasmania, again for a similar sort of reason. So it can be done, but we're going the opposite way at the moment. Um, so think about these age structures. Your largest industry is actually um, primary and secondary school teachers, and it's grown massively, so up 27% since 1996. And that's the age structure of your teachers, of your biggest industry. Um, in 1996, 13% were over the age of 55. By 2006, that was 23%. What will it be now? And this picture looks the same in every region. Yours is just a little older than most of them, but it's still the same sort of age structure. Who's going to replace these retiring teachers? Uh, who will be there to teach your kids in the future? Who will be working in your hospitals? Um, it's your second largest industry for this region. It's grown 12% since 1996, and it will surely grow more as more of us succumb to bad backs and things. Um, 1996, 9% over the age of 55. Um, at 2006, that had jumped up to 21%. And what it, these numbers down here are showing, I should have gone back to the previous one. That is saying that in 1996, there were five labour market entrants for every 10 in the retirement zone, and there we've gone 55 plus. By 2006, that was only two in the entry ages for every 10 in the retirement zone. <coughs> and then you come here to the hospitals, it's fallen from nine in the entry ages for every 10 to three for every 10. So you see these, you know, the impact, well, you can see it in other industries, but the impact of not having um, um, uh, entry level schemes, you know, apprent apprenticeships and so on. So who will buy your farms? And this is a really staggering one, I think. It's your fourth largest industry. Um, it's fallen 12% since 1996, but probably the new census will show a rise because of some cha the changes that I was mentioning. In 1996, 24% were over the age of 55. At the 2006 census, that was 35% of the farmers over the age of, of the grain, sheep and beef farmers over the age of 65. It's gone from five entrants per 10 exits to three per 10. And this is the bit that I would draw your attention to. These people here, these are the un th those are the self-employed, um, without employees, those are employers. These are, the pay um, uh, these are the paid workers. And we know that they are largely imported um, from other countries, especially in this region. And the question is, are they being paid enough to buy those farms? Because who is going to buy them? You know, I talk with Federated Farmers about this. Everybody's talking about succession planning, like as if there's a constant population out there that's going to come through. You've just seen your, your three biggest, your two biggest industries ahead of it. Not too many of them are going to go into farming. The one that sits in between, the third biggest industry here is retail. Um, a very youthful age structure, but they're not going to go out and buy farms either. This picture is the same in all the regions, but it's a bit more pronounced here. So people in these industries need to be aware of the demographics and the implications for, for them to make the plans that they want in the future. I think there's two slides left. Much potential for young Māori. As you know, uh, Māori population is much younger. It has a median age of 23, half the population under the age of 23. For European, that's half the population is uh, 39, under 39 or over 39. And um, I wrote this paper called A Collateral Demographic Dividend on offer. As the retiring baby boomers leave the labour market, young Māori have the potential to come in. There's so many opportunities for young Māori, but there's a lot of work has to go on in order for that to happen. In your area, Māori population is relatively small. But linking it back with the farming, 
you think about the um, attachment to this area for a lot of Māori and you know when you go to who, who will buy the farms and who should buy the farms um, I mean it's not my job to say whether they should be sold to Chinese interests or whatever but it would seem that you know if we're still going to get three another two to three billion people on the planet you know we're still going to feed people for quite a while yet um, we've got farms that are going to be up for grabs for anybody because there's not going to be anybody here to buy them we should really be looking at encouraging you know maybe some of these um, settlement settlements for iwi for example to look at these things and I know they did try for the crater farms population aging needs to be thought about in great detail and here's one just to finish um, that concept of accumulators and decumulators and I, I'll talk about it this afternoon in terms of say Timaru where those two lines just about come together if you look there people aged 65 plus and I call them decumulators only because that's again a, uh, a global and international model that we use to look at it of course some of us are still buying up and doing all sorts of things but housing stock does tend to start get sold off at that age and the people who will buy 25 to 64 that one's flatlining and the decumulators are growing so that's for the whole region translating it into housing costs um, uh, sorry housing prices that's a whole conversation that's got to be had I've only seen one paper on that uh, in this current work that I've been doing I've discovered one paper where this person says that demographic change will put a downward pressure on house prices because of these emptying out regions or you know diminishing populations in the regions will diminish housing prices anyway it terrifies the hell out of me because I have a house in Lawrenceville and um, another and my daughter's one in South Waikato and I look at those populations and <laughs> doesn't look good for the future um, there's a few messages in there but I, I'm always worried about driving a run on housing. <laughs> it's like if you're an early baby boomer, you'll do okay. But if you're a late baby boomer, I'd be looking at that market and selling out before your um, counterparts start selling. Okay, so. So the is sell now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, that is actually I think that is what was reported from it. But I must say, Grant Scobie, as you might know most of him from Treasury, he. He said, he challenged that, he said, um, I've never seen anything like that, that and you know, what are you saying? And I said, what I'm doing here, as, as I've been doing today, is I'm presenting a thought piece. This is the big picture. We don't know, we don't know what questions to ask, ask, we don't know what the answers are, but surely the value of our houses in diminishing regions has got to be on the books, you know. And we just had a young guy from Holland uh, presenting to us a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about all the abandoned houses in lovely areas of, of Holland because of declining populations in the rural areas and people just having to walk away from them. So the big message is ABC of population ageing is accept it is coming to a local area near you even if not right away. Um, I think it's really important that your local population understands these pictures, um, these trends. They have amazing demands for things. Uh, but they want, and especially, you know, start getting up to a third of your population is in the um, rates discount group. <laughs> you know, you, the rates discounts for older people are unsustainable in the future. Um, they need to understand that. Uh, there's a lot of special type matching skills, training needs and so on. I'm sure you work all that out. United Nations says that uh, the numbers are so huge that we can't change them. The, the trends are so huge. They have three frameworks. Um, if you want to keep your population the same size overall, that's not too hard. A certain number of migrants will do it. If you want to keep your working age population the same size, that's a bit harder. If you want to keep the ratio of your current uh, of elderly to working age at its current levels, it's down there impossible. So um, respond in terms of revisiting all your policies and the principles on which they were based because many of those policies were developed when we had the baby boom and when we were youthful and growing. My colleagues that work on Japan, Peter Matanli and um, Roush, they say that it will increasingly come down to things like your town or mine, and that's the debate, that's the um, discussion that's going on in places like Japan and America and a lot of these areas. 
I think we will see the emergence of uh, modern ghost towns. We've got a PhD student going to be looking at that soon. Um, amalgamation, um, not necessarily in terms of your particular TAs, but certainly shared services and so on of certain things, a B word. Your local trouble, if you are a declining region, is a national issue and it should be put on the national agenda and dealt with that way. I mentioned the fiscal equalisation policies and I draw your attention again, Auckland and the rest. Um, Sir Bob and I have presented a few times together and he's very pr proudly telling everybody how Auckland's just going to grow and it's going to take all these young people and I'm thinking, what about Morinsville and my house? Um, <laughs> celebrate. Um, celebrate. Now, we're definitely getting the A accept, although it usually comes with alarm and awareness, you know, awareness and then alarm. What do we do about it? The B is go back and look at all your policies and how you generate your income and how you spend it and all that and revise it. Celebrate. If you do it in time, you will be able to manage the process of the ageing, but you will not be able to stop it. So what we have to start doing is looking for what the advantages are, you know, and uh, many economists are saying that the ending of growth, for example, you won't have to stretch the dollar across more and more people, invest more deeply in the people you have. Uh, we saw on your, on your slide, Ross, the decline in uh, the other welfare, non-superannuation welfare. That's because we, the projection is for uh, diminishing youth unemployment as the labour market tightens up. So there'll be lots of positives, um, but they will, to get to them will have to involve collaboration, they will involve conservation, and yeah, that's the capital deepening, that we'll be able to do capital deepening rather than capital widening. I have been called the Pollyanna demographer <laughs> for my uh, positive approach to it. <laughs> it was to, an attempt to cover off on being called Dr Doom and Gloom and when I first went to Tasmania and told Tasmania about this, but everything that I did say in Tasmania in 1998 has come true and that was the negative labour market entry-exit entry ratios in 28 of the 29 local government areas. Tasmania took over from South Australia as the oldest state um, around about 2003 and I had projected each of those things as had Australian Bureau of Statistics but I was the one that went around talking about it. Um, these things are unfolding and even if they you know, just take a little bit longer to get to you, that's the picture that you're dealing with in the future.